Our gospel for today comes from Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. This is on page 27 in your New Testament, if you'd like to follow along. Hear the good news for this day. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of the repentance, of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is our good news for this day. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. O oh God, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I have to admit something to you. I have read the devotional for today too many times. A lot. It's, it would be embarrassing for me to tell you how many times I read the devotional for today, but just understand, I read it way too many times. Now, as many of you know, as part of <clears throat> as part of the church, uh, we have this thing called the Revised Common Lectionary, and it tells us what readings are for each week. Uh, it's pretty set, and there's usually four readings for each Sunday. There's an Old Testament reading, and then uh, a Psalm, and then a New Testament reading, and then the Gospel. Here at first, we only read two readings. We usually do the gospel, and then whoever the person is that is preaching, they usually pick the other one. Uh, and what I usually pick is something that kind of points to the gospel, or the overall message that I'm trying to give. But when I read today's devotional, it so changed how I read the gospel text that I made it the first reading. I told you about last week that that devotional really changed. No, it was actually this week. And then I set out to replacing them each week uh, of Advent. Because this one, there are so many bits of it that I love. The first part that I love is the honesty. It starts out, what if peace is it possible? It's a thing we throw back at God, that we know that we're meant to be peacemakers. We know that peace will come down the road. But when you look around the world around you, when you look at the war going on within people, you wonder, is it really possible? Another thing I love is the intimacy with God. That God wrapped me in God's arms and told me a story. Who doesn't want that? I want that right now. That and some day clothing. <laughs> Another was this idea that God created us with peace in us. That is part, we normally don't start with that. We normally think we have to work toward peace. But this idea that God made us with peace there, that we push away, that we overwhelm. But my favorite part of the devotional, and the reason we read it, uh, we read this part today. And the reason why I reread it over and over is the back and forth. I don't understand, I buzz. If peace is a part of who we are, then why are we humans so bad? <coughs> God held me a little tighter and said, Little bird, remember how loved you are and start small. Remove stones of anger, hurt, and fear one at a time, and peace will surely grow. This thought, this back and forth does an amazing thing to our gospel text. Many of us, most of us, I think, 
make Jesus into more than a historical figure, right? As we should. We don't just leave him in the stories, but our tradition, a big part of it, is about making him alive in our lives, in our hearts, in our faith. There's an understanding that Jesus walks with us day by day. How many of you have read that poem? The single set of footprints. Jesus walks with us in our daily life. He's not just a historical figure. He's here with us now. And it's none of this is news to you. It's important for us to live like that. But my question is, how many of you do that same thing with John the Baptist? How many of you picture John the Baptist walking daily alongside you? How many of you bring him out from anything more than this historical figure, this cousin of Jesus? But think about the work of John the Baptist. Think about what our scripture says that he was called to do. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. We normally make that a one-off event. John the Baptist prepared the literal way for the literal Jesus, and that was the end of his job, head on a platter. But how did you come to know Jesus? Our devotional makes this question more or less about peace. How did you come to know peace? Well, our devotional says, remember that how you how loved you are and start small. Remove the stones of anger, hurt, and fear one at a time, and peace will surely grow. But how did you come to know not just peace, but Jesus? For most of us, it didn't come from some big event where Jesus literally walked up to you and flipped his majestic hair and said, hey, believe in me. And then you said, okay. No, we had someone, sometimes many someones, paving the way for us to believe in a life grander than merely getting by. A life grander than just good enough. A life grander than remarried, remaining buried under anger and hurt and fear. And those someones, even though they can't live up to Jesus, they still play a vital role, a God-given role in the cosmic play that is our life of faith. This model of John the Baptist, then Jesus, was not a one-off event, but one that plays itself out in every single person over and over again. And here's the strangest part about it. Some people know they're John the Baptist. They know in a particular moment that God is calling them to do something or be something for a particular person. But most of the time in my experience, they have no idea. People are simply living out their calling, going where God sends them, following love, being willing to share what time they have with someone they've come across that needs their time. Nothing more grand than that. Just a pause. I was a youth pastor for about three years, and then on and off at other times, but for three solid years, I was a youth pastor. Junior high, it's a hard time. I cannot remember over those three years a single devotional that I did with those kids. I can't remember one. But I do remember my youth pastor when I was a youth pastor. And I do remember the time when they shared why they believed in Jesus. He said, before Jesus died, all the disciples, all of them, abandoned Jesus. And just a few years later, all of them, all of them, chose to give up their lives rather than abandon him again. Something had to happen in the middle to change that. Something that we would call the resurrection. And he said, that's why I believe. Because of whatever that is in the middle. That story, that proof, was the first time that I ever took the Jesus story seriously. 
Many, many years later, I happened to run into this youth pastor again when I was, in fact, a pastor, which he got a kick out of. <laughs> Did not see that coming. <laughs> so I asked him, I said, do you remember you told me this story about why you believed in Jesus? And he said, did I really ever say that? I don't remember that. <laughs> Not all John the Baptists are aware of what they're doing. But God still sends them and gives them everything they need to get through to you. I'm a terrible traveler. In most cases, I just go where people point me. I'd rather be reading a book, having a beer at home, watching a sporting event with a friend. I'm largely lost on going. I mean, the number of times I, you know, I walked up to the Leaning Tower of Pisa and thought, oh, okay. <laughs> I just go where I'm told. Well, one time I was going through Europe, and I went, walked up to the customs agent, and I handed them my passport. And they said, where are you coming from? I said, I don't know. <laughs> they said, okay. <laughs> Where are you going? I said, I don't know. <laughs> the tour guide told me to come up to here. I'm handing you my passport. Yay! Got and looked around at the other agents. Stabbed my passport and just let me go. <laughs> <laughs> I have heard so many presentations at so many historical sites that I'm ashamed to admit how I automatically just zone out when I'm in one of these presentations. Hopefully it's different now, but that's how it was back in the day. Now I just try to keep kids from doing things. But. So when I was in Assisi, Italy, in the room underneath where St. Francis was buried, and Brother Matthew, the Franciscan monk, walked downstairs to tell us about the life of St. Francis, I zoned out. And so I was more surprised than nearly anyone when words broke through my zoning out. And I heard the words that I needed to hear to go to seminary in that moment from a monk I'd never met. No one was more surprised, I should say, than me than but Brother Matthew was. He had no idea he'd spoken any God-oriented words in that moment. He had simply given his shoe. One last story. You've heard this story before, some of you. It took about nine months for me to find my first church. And I'm not the most patient person, uh, but I went to many interviews, many uh, preached a lot of sermons. I was always the bridesmaid, never the bride. And it was grating on me, and so I was out in front of a bar one night, staring up at the stars, silently yelling in my head, God, what do you want me to do? Or, am I not meant to be a pastor? And a homeless man came by and asked me for change for the bus. I gave it to him, and he turned back to me and he said, If you want to know God's will in your life, you have to be patient. And then kept on walking. Did he know what he was saying? Did he know the effect of his words? I would not be a pastor here now if not for those words in that moment. It wasn't necessarily him, but God looking through him. Did any of these three know that I would be here today in front of you? If you ask them, the answer is probably no. But still, God worked through those three. The stones of cynicism, apathy, lostness were pushed away from me by those three John the Baptists. And all they were doing was walking down their own path, following their own calling, taking a moment to share with a neighbor. Our devotional said, And God lifted up my arms and set me out to fly, and I realized that grounded in God's love, I was beautiful and wild and free, and peace was a part of me. So I flew home and stayed up all night writing love letters and tearing down walls so that the peace in me could fly to the peace in you. 
so many times we focus on being little Christ in the world, and that is a worthy goal, and you should shoot for that, but let's be honest. That's a little high mark for a lot of us. We're not all going to succeed at being little Jesuses in the world. But we should also try to be little John the Baptist. People that lift the stones of anger, hurt, and fear off of the hearts of God's children. There is one steady truth. We cannot move these stones on our own. But the good news of today is that we don't have to. God walks with us, moves with us, and leads us where we need to go. Amen.